And the next speaker is Professor Per Roland from the University of Copenhagen. We have to know that Per is the person who, for the very first time, could show cognitive activities in the human brain. Could show, I mean, he was the first person in the world who could visualize cognitive functions by using molecular imaging techniques. He was the first person who could measure the energy costs of thinking, published his famous paper on the energy requirements of producing a single thought. And he has been the first professor of positron emission tomography in the world at the Karolinska Institute. I was lucky to learn from Per a lot of things. And apart from my mentor, Janos Sentagotai, I learned the most from Per. And Per is now back to his hometown, Copenhagen. And he is a professor at the University of Copenhagen and doing interesting research in neurodynamics. Right. So um, I'm going to, to be a little bit provocative. Uh, so um, um, see, so I put up this question, what is vision? Uh, the way we think about things, also in science, have severe influence of what we are doing. So science is uh, perhaps 60% concepts and 40% uh, experiments. Is this better? OK. So uh, what is vision? Well, according to Korean tradition, vision is a property of the eye. So if you have lost your eyes, you're blind, and you can't see. So uh, Korean tradition doesn't have uh, a history of uh, the urge of looking into things and see how they are actually working. This uh, is something I think that came with the Renaissance in Europe, where people started to dissect uh, the, uh, uh, and to find the mechanisms operating in the human body and eventually in the human brain. So really, what we mean by vision, or what is vision, is in a Western sense, what is the, uh, is this on? This is not on, right? That's probably why it was different. Okay. Is it on? No, now it is definitely on. Um, <laughs> so, um, what, really what we mean is which are the mechanisms of uh, vision. And um, there are different ways of approaching this question. We can use words like is used sometimes in cognitive neuroscience and describe several functions with words that we think belong to the domain of vision. But our parcellation this way doesn't really tell us how the machinery works in the brain. Um, in in the Western culture, there are two schools. One is the North American school, US and Canada. Uh, and this school has uh, a fundamental assumption. And that is that the, our surround is composed of visual attributes, such as orientation, direction of movement, uh, binocular vision of death, uh, seeing colors, and so on. And in the brain, uh, there are populations of neurons in the visual cortex taking care, neurons specialized into uh, the analysis of uh, a particular uh, a particular visual attributes, or if you get higher up in this anatomically constructed hierarchy, uh, they will take combinations of visual aspects as their specificity. So 
in the North American school, uh, seeing is produced by this anatomical feed forward machinery uh, that either uh, goes into what is called the what direction and in the steps of hierarchies combines uh, neurons firing to more and more complex uh, combinations of the uh, original visual attributes out there. There is already some troubles with this uh, assumption of parallelism, this assumption that there, is, that there are fixed relations between our visual surround and what neurons do, when neuron, what neurons fire to in the visual cortex. So to be absolutely uh, uh, waterproof, they also in include as visual attributes something that's not out there. And here are conceptual problems. We can see contours when there is no contour in the surround. Now, there are other uh, problems with this. So if they postulate a parallel operation within the visual system, we are left with the problem that then how do we get uh, a, shall we say, unified picture of Jean-Pierre talking uh, here? Um, and uh, the answer to this is basically that it's not known, or it's done by some sort of synchronicity between the neurons firing in this uh, and, and in this uh, shall we say, parallel processing stream. Now, there are troubles with this synchronicity proposal as well, uh, and uh, we can discuss that explicitly, but the main thing is that uh, if you shuffle your data, uh, it, the, uh, the amount of synchronicity between, say, an object and ba background doesn't change. And that's a, 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 a difficult one. Now, what then to do? Well, um, before I leave the North American school, uh, I should also show you this. There is some uh, evidence that there is specialization uh, in a hierarchical fashion. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, article has the title of the invariant visual representation. By representation is meant that neurons do fire to some particular uh, item object in the surround. In this case, the object is a TV actress. Uh, so if you look at the post-stimulus histogram, we sort of sum many trials of neuron responses. This looks reasonably acceptable. However, if you go further in and look at each trial in which this uh, presumably famous uh, um, TV actress is presented in front of an actually awake human being being recorded from the parahippocampal drive, you can see that there are trials when the neurons actually does not at all respond. Like this trial here, the neuron doesn't respond at all. So where is the invariant representation? See, the neuron and the brain, if there was these fixed relations, has to respond every time. Yes, there is no fixed relations, right? And then there's no invariant visual representation. You will also see schemes such as this. Uh, this is, again, a hierarchical scheme explaining how we can recognize uh, uh, objects uh, within shall we say, 100 to 120 milliseconds. Now, it takes about 110 to 140 milliseconds for humans to perceive a visual scene. Psychophysically, uh, there are several studies supporting this. This is, again, a feast-forward scheme. And here you see the latencies uh, when the neurons, in average, start to fire. But this scheme is, is uh, shall we say, deceiving. 
because it does not, as is indicated here, uh, happen that the neurons first in V1 responds to some external object, then send meshes uh, to V2, V4, and so on. These are the average ones, but already at 45 to uh, 60 milliseconds, the frontal eye fields are engaged. So this is hugely overlapping and not really telling the truth. And by the way, it's feed forward. Then what can we do if we don't accept the North American school of thought for explaining vision? Well, we can borrow concepts from other disciplines. Neuroscience is, is a relatively young discipline. So in order to achieve, shall we say, prestige, uh, people have tried to borrow uh, ideas from control theory, signal theory, computer theory, and information theory to explain what goes on in the brain. But the question is really, has any of these approaches that were not developed to understand how the brain works, have they told us more about what the brain does? For example, the, here the, the culture is, is mixed. Signal en uh, energy uh, schemes are, uh, or have been very popular in the North American school, but even uh, proponents, strong proponents such as Tony Moffshen now declare that it doesn't work simply for more complex patterns. Uh, information theory, the pioneers, uh, applying information theory to neuroscience were Don Mackay and, and Horace Barlow in, in England. And um, this is also a rather, uh, shall we say, deceiving uh, way of, of, uh, of, of uh, presenting the problem uh, of the mechanics in, in the brain in the sense that uh, one postulates that there is a code carried by uh, the spikes in the brain because the spikes, the action potentials, may come in a, second, uh, in a particular order. Uh, so people have been looking for the spike code uh, now for 60 years. Now you saw already in the example with the faces that there is such a trial to trial variability. So if a code exists, it doesn't exist for a single neuron. That means there's no single neuron in the brain that can code for any item in the outside world. Now, then you can say, OK, it's not the single neuron. It's a population of neurons that code for items in the world. Now, also, this is uh, troublesome. Uh, because there has been no such convincing result showing that there really is a population code coding for uh, external items. We can now go to the European school of thought. And this is represented by this gentleman. He looks quite tired, but that's because he wrote a big book. <laughs> and um, this book is about the physics of vision. Now, he writes that vision is indirect. So what it really is, the problem for the brain, is to make some conclusions about what is out there by, uh, by the observation of the reflected light from objects or the emitted light from objects in the surround. And this problem cannot be solved uniquely, which Herman von Helmholtz already showed. He investigated binocular vision and says, this is an underdetermined process. It's not possible to have unique solutions. So there is no such relation between, uh, fixed relation between the visual surround uh, and what goes on in the brain. So what? What Helmholtz said was that the way it works, he didn't know the exact mechanisms, but he knew two things, that what we 
what we infer about the surrounding world comes from uh, our uh, nerven erregungen, that is the nervous activity, uh, what that tells us, and that makes us make a conclusion about what we see. But it's never, never any conscious process. This is done unconsciously, and it becomes conscious at the time where we make the inference. So vision, at least initial vision, is unconscious. Now, um, oops. It is locked in some way here that I cannot escape. There it goes. Okay, so we are in a constraint, a time constraint. Within 150 milliseconds, the brain, all its neurons, have, uh, are working with visual uh, 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 action potentials, had to uh, come to a conclusion. Now, if you look spatial temporally uh, into the cortex along 16 leads, here at the outer part of the cortex, here is the white matter, and you look at the instantaneous spiking rate, you can see it takes some time uh, for the spikes uh, when you present a visual object in the outside to, to reach the uh, primary visual cortex here, and then you can see that the rate is highly nonlinear for the first 150 milliseconds. And this has also severe implications for our mathematical description. It means that there are no linear measures that can describe the initial vision. Furthermore, there is no steady state dynamics explaining initial vision. And of course, uh, correlations and other linear measures uh, are not entirely meaningful. Neither is it meaningful to postulate that there are oscillations, that is, with fixed periodicity, uh, making us see within 150, because there is no such steady state to, to uh, where, where these oscillations can have uh, a, a certain bandwidth. Right, so what to do now? Should we throw it all away? Well, it hasn't been too successful. We still don't know how the brain works. Uh, shall we say 65 years after Richard Jung and Hubel and Wiesel. So my proposal is that we should maybe not throw it all away, but we should try to uh, look at vision with no assumptions, no uh, assumptions, and go into what is, what is the essentials of the operation of the brain. Well, nerve neurons can spike, and when they spike, the membrane potential changes. I mean, these are observables, and from those, we might be able to produce, uh, shall we say, a kind of, of theory or working hypothesis uh, doing experiments in space-time. Like most of the experiments done in vision are done on the temporal dynamics. But it might be time for neuroscience to enter at least the 20th century and work in space-time. Now, what I'm going to do now in the, the second part of this talk is to make a proof of concept. We cannot go through it, I cannot convince you totally, but I can make a proof of concept that this will be sufficient to understand at least the processing uh, when uh, animals are exposed to very simple scenes. 
There is, uh, again, one problem. When we have to look at, into the cerebral cortex, uh, it, it's a terrible mesh. It's a terrible uh, network that uh, when we look at it, top in the, such a small cylinder, there will be around 180 neurons here. Um, most of them excitatory, but about 20% of them inhibitory. However, all the neurons outside in a, with a radius of 600 something micrometers will also have axon endings, dendrites entering this small volume with a width of 60 microns. So when we look at that, we must realize that, that first of all, that the space we are looking at is course, made out of many neurons in each point we are looking at. But it's not continuous either. It's a discrete space we have uh, and a continuous time. So the, the uh, proposal that I am going to make is that vision is the product of excitation and inhibition. That might not be so so revolutionary, and the spiking dynamics of the visual system. And this space-time dynamics will produce sometimes the ridicule vision, something that is pretty much close to what is out there, sometimes non veridical vision, uh, which are the illusions you have when you watch your TV or uh, if you look at your bathroom, uh, Herman illusions. Uh, the dynamics is most often driven by visual transients. These occur when we open the eyes or move the eyes to fixate a new point in, in, in space. Uh, there is a strong lateral spreading of the uh, membrane potential excitation and uh, uh, lateral interactions uh, secure uh, by mutual excitation inhibition uh, some uh, order in uh, the visual uh, space. Uh, now, those who did the hard work uh, are not here, but uh, um, I am just the one playing around and making ideas that they are not responsible for, okay? So when I would take the example of a moving object. When objects are moving, in the surround. Here we have a very simple object moving in the surround, and we are looking at the first uh, four visual areas of the ferret visual, of, of the ferret. Now, the ferret is anesthetized, so it's unconscious. Now, when this uh, little square is shown, moving either up or downwards, uh, it will be mapped in succession along the, uh, the uh, border uh, of the area 17 and 18. And so if the ferret doesn't move its eyes, and it doesn't because they're paralyzed, then uh, the representation or mapping of that object will move in this direction. With a delay, uh, it will also be mapped in uh, a next uh, 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 border that between area 19 and 21 and move in the same direction. However, with a delay. Now, then why is it that we don't see for each of these mappings objects with a delay? There are many visual areas also in the ferret cortex, almost 20. So the ferret should see about 20 uh, different objects moving around in, uh, uh, because of the delays and uh, the mappings. Now. What we experimentally do is that we, we take electrodes and put them uh, into the, uh, the brain at primary visual cortex, sometimes in, in, in along this border here. And uh, one can see that if one, one uh, uh, does that, uh, there is uh, an increase in the spiking, first in the middle layers of the cortex spreading to the superficial and deep layers of the cortex. So this is a kind of, of simple space-time uh, diagram of the 
propagation of spiking at a certain point. Now, since the representation moves, uh, we can put another electrode here and then see what happens. And you can already see that this spike train deforms. So neither is this pattern stationary over space. It also transforms, and if especially the lower layers start to fire uh, at a relatively early, before the, the peak firing takes place. So where is the object actually located in the brain? Now, the other thing we do is that we, we stain the cortex with a multi-sensitive dye, and the purpose is to follow the changes in the membrane potential, which we can do the membrane potential at the cortical point, which is the mesh of all these axon terminals and dendrites. A very small part of the cortex with a resolution of about 100 microns. These dyes are extremely fast. Within one microsecond, they would change conformation and report changes in the membrane potential. Now, it's been shown by Carl Peterson's uh, group uh, in particular that if you record from the neuron and record the membrane potential, then the change in the membrane potential and the changes in the voltage sensitive dye signal are proportional, at least within physiological conditions. And this means that if we differentiate the, uh, if we differentiate the voltage sensitive dye signal, uh, it will be uh, an indicator uh, of whether there are, compared to the baseline, fluctuations uh, in the net excitation direction or in the net inhibition direction. That means if there's statistically uh, increased uh, derivative of the uh, fluctuations of the, of, the, uh, of the dye signal, it indicates net excitation if it's the sufficient uh, statistically uh, depressed net inhibition. Now, we have to make a simplification. For each point we are looking at, we can look at either the, the dye signal or its derivative. And uh, of course, the course of these changes are the spiking. But we do not know whether the spiking is local or whether it originates in another cortical area when we observe this. We can find out which are the spikes that are local by putting down an electrode and see whether the local neuron spikes. We, and then we can try to sort them and see if which are uh, inhibitory or which are excitatory. Now, under the assumption, and now I'm make, making assumptions, that the leak conductor, see, another way to express changes in the membrane potential is to say that it is the sum of all the transmembrane current taking place in the neuron. And uh, this sort of one way of, instead of listing all the different uh, currents, sodium, calcium, uh, chloride, one can also group them together into excitatory, that is outward current, uh, and um, inhibitory. Now, there is a third term here. This is the leak term, the leak conductance times the difference between the membrane potential and the reversal potential for, for, for the leak uh, uh, conductances. And under the assumption that this is relatively stable, we can make this inference. If this doesn't change too much, then the changes must be either in the excitatory or the inhibitory conductances, okay. So when we do that, and then what I'm saying next is all statistically significant, either Benferroni corrected or uh, with false discovery rates better than 0 0.05. So first, we look at these four areas, and a, uh, a, a bar is shown moving uh, downwards. And uh, you will see it will first be mapped here, and then the membrane potential uh, increases will spread in the direction of mo motion, but this is transitory. They will not be uh, limited to what it should, where, namely where the neurons should be mapped when firing. Uh, 
but it will spread outside to encompass almost the whole cortex. Now, this is something that reviewers don't like because it doesn't fit with the current understanding that things are mapped, particular places in the cortex, and why should this membrane potential increases go over the whole cortex? It does, and there's a reason for that uh, dynamically. So it can spread. Um, and you can also appreciate another thing, if I start it once more, that you can see that there is actually a delay between the, the uh, the 1718 mapping and the 1921 mapping. If you look carefully at it, you will see that, and you will also maybe see some indications of, of a backward propagation uh, toward. Okay, now you could say we do not know what uh, what is is due to motion and what is due to uh, the. Uh, what is due to motion and what is due to, um, to just presenting one bar that, uh, that might uh, make a transient that propagates. So if we subtract that in the same uh, uh, animals, we can see what is the particular, uh, 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 what is the particular uh, uh, response to the motion of, of the of the bar, and you can see here that the membrane potential change proceeds uh, in the direction of motion here. Uh, so this is what is in excess of just presenting one stationary bar that's going to be mapped. You can also see that it disappears. Here's the the, um, the uh, number of, of membrane, uh, the number of uh, uh, milliseconds after the the the, the stimulus was presented. You can read that out there. Now there is another, this, uh, another peculiarity of this dynamics that is that it, if the bar is processing in one direction, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, membrane potential will increase in that direction, far ahead of where the bar is actually mapped by its firing. So here are, uh, with black, some electrode points. Whenever the uh, spiking exceeds the spontaneous spiking, there is always spontaneous activity in the visual cortex. They are spiking with no objects there, but there is, in this case, more spiking when the object is presented and mapped. So it's mapped here. And so the uh, black uh, uh, electrode position there turns white whenever the uh, 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 amounts of spike in the short time interval exceeds that of the spontaneous activity uh, in any layer. But it's mostly, uh, yeah, in any layer. So uh, you will see that uh, if we do look at that, you will see that there is First, a progression in area 19 and 21, and then a progression in, in uh, 17, 18, and then uh, the, the uh, neuron spike approximately uh, lo co-localized with the hot spot of the, uh, of the membrane potential increases. Now, if I do this, one more time, but more slowly, you, will you can appreciate what happens initially. So initially, uh, after uh, approximately some 90 to 100 milliseconds, the neurons in area 19, 21, which is the higher order visual area, starts to produce a membrane potential increase in the direction of object mapping, that is motion over the cortex. This has not yet reached the, the uh, primary visual cortex. So this leads the primary visual cortex. Now after a, another, um, after a short delay, there is uh, a uh, 
communication from the higher order area to the lower order area. So now the lower order area produces a similar uh, extended membrane potential increase, which is sufficient to fire neurons far ahead of the, of the actual uh, mapping of the objects. So now neurons are firing ahead of where the object is mapped, um, as you can see. And uh, they pretty much sort of predict if the velocity is, and direction is constant, uh, the future uh, of the mapping in the cortex. So this, uh, you might say, is a kind of uh, prediction or uh, future mapping. Now, how is this mechanism uh, in, in detail? Well, if we look at now the derivative and actually the net, then the net excitation in the, in the membrane potentials, we can see this is at time 108 milliseconds after the, after the uh, presentation of the moving stimulus. Uh, you can see that there is a propagation of this synaptic activity from uh, net excitation, which is synaptic, uh, from this area uh, up to uh, the, these lower order areas. Uh, in those uh, 25 milliseconds here from 120 to around 50. So there is a, a back propagation, uh, meaning that, that uh, all is not uh, really uh, feed forward uh, within the 150 milliseconds it takes. If we then look at the neurons, uh, remember if we start the object here at this point and, and then it's mapped here, we can go to this point and see, okay, 250 milliseconds later, it's mapped here. And now at this mapping point, um, what happens in, in, in between? Now looking at when the neurons start to fire in the different layers, we can see that in the beginning, the neurons start to fire in the granular layer. That is the layer receiving the spikes from the retina. But very soon, uh, uh, after a uh, 100 to 125 milliseconds, this picture reverses. Now the neuron starts to fire in the supergranular and intergranular layers, which are not the layers receiving the, the, the spikes from the retina. But it is, we think it has something to do because it's uh, coinciding with the back propagation of synaptic activity between the two areas, and that is known to have targets in the supergranular layers and the infragranular layers. So now this leads the spiking, uh, the start of the spiking in the granular layers. Now, now, what about then the mapping of the actual object? Now, since they are are since there is a delay of uh, approximately. Uh, 15 uh, to 20 milliseconds between the uh, uh, excitation of the primary visual cortex and the secondary areas here. Uh, how is this solved? Then, so we don't see all these multiple uh, uh, representations when there is only one object. Well. This is a phase diagram, meaning that here uh, the uh, membrane potentials are uh, all normalized to one, one being the maximum at each point in the cortex and uh, uh, zero being the, the minimum. Okay, so in this phase diagram, you can see that in the beginning, there is a phase difference of the membrane potential increases between areas 1921 leading, although they were later excited, and after a while, uh, and the back propagation, as you have seen, of net excitation, they become into phase at approximately uh, 150 milliseconds, and then they proceed in phase uh, forward. Now, what is then the relation between the membrane potential and the net excitation and net inhibition? Well, 
actually at the point when uh, we, or when the ferret uh, is supposed to be finished with its visual processing, which is around 150 milliseconds, there is a net inhibition that holds for if you present the stationary, if you present the moving stimulus, it's below baseline. So we have a net inhibition uh, in, in the cortex. These are the standard error of mean uh, of uh, eight ferrets. And now it doesn't matter where uh, the, the, the object. So this is where the object is introduced. You have the initial transient. Uh, excitation, and that rapidly goes uh, over about 100 milliseconds. Uh, so there is a net inhibitory regime uh, uh, around uh, for 100, at least to 200, 200 milliseconds, no matter whether it's stationary or, or a moving stimulus. This means that this, uh, we, we think that this net, net inhibitory regime stabilizes the, the perception of the of the stationary uh, stimulus. Now, if this is so, that, uh, that it uh, produces, uh, that there is a production of uh, activity ahead of objects uh, being mapped, moving in the outside world, then we should be able to predict when two objects actually uh, presented at different uh, position will collide. Remember, this is all this is all uh, anesthetized and unconscious animal. So here is the screen in real time, and two objects are presented. Uh, moving towards each other. And this is what you can see that going here comes the two up first in 1921, and then the excitations meet here in 20. 1718, and uh, after that, the, there is a general suppression of the uh, exoter uh, of the activity of the membrane activity. Now, if you look at this table, this is where the center, where this occlusion takes place of the two objects when they clash. If you wish, you can see that the neurons in this condition start to to fire significantly before the fire when we just had up or down moving objects. Meaning that from this time, the, the brain could make the inference that something is going to happen at the central field of view uh, and where the objects are. And we think that this, this activity, this spiking, which is mainly in the, in the infragranular layers, uh, projecting to the, the uh, uh, nuclei the, controlling the moving of the eyes. That's the hypothesis. So that one can actually make a saccade to the center, uh, namely where the, the objects are going to, to uh, collide. Furthermore, you can see that if we start them 10 degrees, 10.5 degrees away, and they, and, and they run with 25 degrees per second, they will be predicted to clash at 412 milliseconds after the start. You can see here that peak activity uh, in the occlusion condition is 413 milliseconds. Now, if we look at this uh, again, uh, we observe the same thing. Here is the, the uh, uh, derivative of the, of the multisensitive dye, and uh, the red is the occlusion condition. Uh, you can see already prior to the occlusion, uh, some 100 milliseconds prior to the occlusion, the, uh, the derivative goes, goes negative below baseline, indicating net inhibition. And, and at that time, the derivative of the rate, which is the smoothest uh, uh, post-stimulus histogram uh, derivative, uh, <coughs> is exactly zero at 400 and, and at uh, 10, 20 milliseconds. So meaning that the maximum firing is, is there. And this can also be seen in the later. Now, um, then what about, uh, 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 there is an object and there is a background, but this activity has been spreading all over the place 
uh, and uh, how is the object segmented from the background? So one uh, 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 possible solution to this is the uh, actually backpropagating activity that will eventually uh, hit the, where the object is, is mapped when it is uh, occluded. You can follow, and you can see that then uh, the, the ex excitation surrounds uh, a, a, an area where the uh, uh, derivative starts to they become negative. So this is the, the same mechanism is seen uh, if we introduce a stationary object. So, a sh so imagine that now the machinery has worked for some time and you have made the saccade exactly to the center where the occlusion, then you can see sharply what is the object in the surround. Where it would be, first it will be blurred, but when it's in your focus, uh, you will see it sharply. So uh, if we introduce, then it would behave like a stationary object because then one can follow it with the eyes approximately at least, and then uh, you see that the similar mechanism uh, of excitation, first of the mapping site, and then uh, uh, rapidly shifting into a net in inhibition, as shown here. So first excitation, here, and then uh, temporary segmentation, at least, uh, will uh, perhaps provide uh, the signal for the segmentation of figure two. Now, in the monkey, uh, Victor Lange and collaborators made a similar uh, uh, observation long before we did. So this is the spiking rate here. This is time from showing such a bar that I have just shown you. Time zero, time 100, time 200 milliseconds. You can see that also in the spiking, there is a broad initial activity when a bar is introduced. Then only after 100 to 120 milliseconds, this activity converge and cool down, perhaps, by uh, a net inhibitory regime so that the borders of the bar become mapped and stay on so for the next 100 milliseconds. Now, finally, uh, if I have five or six more minutes, uh, what about illusions then? Like, why do we, for example, see uh, things uh, moving uh, when there is no motion? Like, when you look at the TV or uh, videos, YouTube, there's no motion, of course. This is just a sequence of stationary pictures. But how comes that the uh, that uh, so we presented a small bar like this. I mean, there's no motion. If you see motion, this is because your brain sees motion, because this is just one square flashed sequentially at three different positions. Now, let's resume this uh, here. Uh, you. This didn't like. Okay, good. Well, in in apparent motion, as this illusion is called, something quite similar is is happening. So there is first. And this can perhaps be more more efficiently seen if we look at the face at the face uh, a diagram of these four of the membrane potential changes in these four areas. First, you can see again the, the, the area 1921 is leading. And then after a, uh, a report, could you, could you see that? Or is it too dark? It's quite dark, it is. But uh, you can at least see here it leads in the direction of apparent motion 1921 areas. and then. There is a phase alignment, and then it progresses. So, uh, and you can say, oh, this is all, all subtracial activity. But it isn't. Now, if you record the spiking 
in between those two points where the map, mapping of the squares are, they, they're firing, this, this would be spontaneous firing, that's a spiking uh, in, in, in the same time. But after, after when you present the, an apparent motion, this is when just they are flashed, one and then another one with a long delay in between. So there's no significant uh, spying. But here's a significant increase of spying right at the time when this uh, uh, back propagating activity reaches the primary cortex and then you have increased spying for some time uh, in between those two mapping points. So now this temporal sequence fits exactly with the psychophysics of humans. So if we increase the distance, then in order to see apparent motion, they have to be flashed far, faster after each other. This is called curler solution. In, our, in, the, ferret, in the unconscious ferret, this, this is, is uh, also the case. Now, this is just some thoughts uh, kind of showed that it, it might be plausible that what that it's not coding, it's simply the space-time dynamics that cre creates, uh, shall we say, the changes in within 150 milliseconds uh, to give a, a picture uh, of the surround uh, in a, uh, shall we say, that's plausible for simple scenes. And since the affairs were anesthetized, they're all unconscious. Uh, but uh, similar, at least traits of these dynamics have been observed also recently uh, in monkeys. The back propagation of, act, of synaptic activity from V2 to V1, for example. Uh, this is the, the space-time dynamics that sort of creates these simple scenes for moving objects. And uh, uh, it seems that after the back propagation, the system engages in to a state of net inhibition, uh, keeping a stable, uh, metastable states. But uh, now uh, shaping the exact. Uh, vision and perhaps the segmentation. That's all I have to say uh, now. Uh, but thank you, Per. So we started at one o'clock. We have questions. Fresh, quite some question time. Fifteen minutes. So, jump here. Yeah. Did you check uh, in the non anesthetized animal what's happening? Well, we do not have any permission to do that. We are doing this in, uh, we can do it in mice. So uh, we try to see if the same dynamics apply in awake mice, but uh, I have Is no there any additional dynamics which is taking place during consciousness? Sorry? Is there any additional uh, change in the dynamics? Well, if we, we should look, I don't know. I can't tell you because uh, we have to look. This is a different species. Now, what we could do, we could extend these observations to humans. Yes. Yes. But that will require a little bit of technological development because we have to work in a space time where our, our time scale is sub-millisecond and uh, we have to look at large part of the, of the brain. But uh, in principle, it's possible. So, you know? If I understood you well, the sentence initial vision is unconscious. Would you like then to separate really uh, conscious and unconscious processes on the basis of the uh, no. processing time? No, I cannot do that. I cannot do that. But uh, um, what I can say is that there is a dynamics that you are not aware of in your brain and none here are aware of. It's not possible with the insight uh, to be aware of these, of this, these mechanisms. So in that sense, 
they will be unconscious. Once the, in, in, in my view, once the solution is there and the communication between visual areas relaxed, uh, again to that of spontaneous, uh, relax, let's say that, then that happens within these 100 in 10 to 150 milliseconds. And then I think that's when you see the scene clearly. It takes some time. Why does it take some time? My suggestion is it takes some time to see a new visual scene clearly because the dynamics has to evolve in order to make your brain see it. But isn't that a bit contradictory what you say now to your hypothesis of the parallelity? Because but that's uh, not my hypothesis. <laughs> That's North American. Well, you started oh, from, from no, that no, point no, that no, uh, no, no, no. Uh, the started, bad Americans were doing the serial processing I, I, idea, the I, good I, Europeans were the parallel ones. I, and, uh, and just one, one more addition to that. Uh, Yula, I was making fun of these <laughs> theories. I don't believe them. I think we should not have these assumptions in, in today's cognitive neuroscience. But, but to me, this, uh, uh, I still don't understand uh, uh, that conclusion with the uh, initial unconscious processes because uh, that's not my, that's not, first of all, that's not my invention. It's Helmholtz's invention, yeah, okay. right? Now, secondly, I cannot claim that initial vision is totally unconscious. You're not blind every time you move your eyes or open your eyes. You're not blind but you don't see clearly. 150 milliseconds is enough to decide if in a scene you have an yeah. animal, yeah. you have a face, yeah. uh, um, go, no, go decision, yeah. it's 150 yeah. milliseconds. That's what I wanted to say, that uh, yeah. uh, that's somehow, to me, contradictory, because that's a conscious detection, at least, of an object. After that, so, so let me make, make it perfectly clear. After that, then, of course, everything is accessible. Do you understand what I'm saying? After this initial uh, dynamics has taken place, you will see things clearly. That's what you do. It, it's skeptical. Yeah, um, I did a single cell recording uh, when I was in grad school, so I heavily, I'm heavily trained in uh, the American school. So um, what I believe, I assume, Ferret has a similar visual cortical hierarchy um, like that in macaque monkeys, and the activation started from lower area visual areas and the progress to higher visual areas. But um, so that's why we thought that this is a feedforward pathway. But the question is, um, as a record from monkey, uh, that was from monkeys, but from human subjects, when we present some students very fast, like um, 30 milliseconds. And the person can judge like it's a face, or it's a happy face, it's very fast. So it seems there are two processes. One is feed forward, and the other is just bypass the feed forward and go from the higher area. Higher area. And in, because I study um, in humans, I study um, face, but in um, animal, I study motion perception, optical flow field. Um, so the question is, I think from human subjects, actually we think the face processing probably is something holistically. So it's like a holistic, holistic process, um, holistic perception of the face processed faster than the local um, detailed information. Yeah. So, so if I understand your question correctly, yeah. you can say, why is it possible for humans to be able to see a face right. uh, within 30 milliseconds? Now, this within 30 milliseconds Three, is, zero, a, yeah. is Three. a little bit tricky, because I think what you're doing is you're showing your mm -hmm. stimulus lasting 30 milliseconds, and then something else is happening, right? Yeah. Now, that's not, you, but your, your subject is not responding within 30 milliseconds. The, your subject is reporting that he is seeing something. Yes, but in I use... The, in those 30 mm -hmm. milliseconds, right? Now, that's one thing. The other thing is that, of course, there is something but it's not the choo-choo train going from V1 to V2 to V4 to AIT to CIT. To, uh, that's not what's happening. So in this sense, the North American school is wrong. It's, and 
they are wrong in another sense. It's not only a feed-forward process. During the short time alluded to, shall we say, get an impression of a visual scene. It's also, there are also back-propagating synaptic activity. And this is, is uh, uh, so in these two yeah. senses. So how does this unconscious processing uh, related to um, something that's like automatic, like uh, exogenous attention? Like you assume there's something, the onset of the stimulus, it's just onset, then you just catch your attention. But although these are sedative, uh, sedative animals, so we well, if I If I was a, a, a cognitive neuroscientist, I wouldn't use the term attention uh, in this context. I think it's, uh, uh, it's something you can control, yeah. right? So uh, here, at we, we, we cannot see anything about we, we studying anesthetized animals wouldn't tell us much about attention. You can say, are there dynamics mm -hmm. that might influence attention? And that is a hypothesis, but that could very well be because the initial transient is very mm -hmm. strong and will spread also to higher areas. So have you tried to uh, record from the behaving animal instead of the no, staging? No, we have, we are, as I said to, to Jean-Pierre, uh, we are on our way, we are doing that, but on, we cannot do that with carnivores. So we are, we are stuck with mice, and mice, mice? mice? a totally different organization of their visual areas. Mice has poor vision, so how do you study vision in mice? Actually? Oh, you can. They have vision. They're, they're, it's they're, just they're, not so good. They, they have nocturnal. They <laughs> have night vision. No, 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 no. <laughs> no they, their receptive fields are ten degrees. Yes, maybe sometimes larger, but uh, you can study. There are several groups. Matteo Carandini, who uh, you perhaps know, yeah. who is doing he it, and use, others yeah. are doing Neil and Stryker and all. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Thanks. Very question. Fair. I'm interested, what is the safeguard in this system to differentiate between real perception and illusory perception? Because as you explained, I fully agree with you, basically in the brain the dynamics is the same when you see a real something, a real contour and an illusory it, contour. It, it, so you it, don't it, really have a mechanism in this system. Well, it is it, 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 it not exactly the same. You could see it was a little bit jerky with the, with the apparent motion, but of course, that might be because we haven't hit the exact smooth transition. But if you present them a little bit uh, uh, slower, uh, then you will have a, a, a smooth progression. In my expectation, we haven't tried it. So, uh, well, we don't really make actually any decisions whether things are illusory or not. We just see them that way. We see uh, the mo in the mo motion blindness after looking at something passing over of, uh, a, a, a stable uh, object, it disappears. And why does it disappear? It disappears because of dynamic, but then we see it disappearing, but it's still there. Uh, si similarly, the, this generation they're occupied with their cellular phones and, and, and looking at moving images, uh, their friends, uh, wherever. It, there's a, we live in an illusionary society. I mean, it's, a, it's growing, uh, but we, we don't, we don't make, I, I, how can we stop that? Those dirty illusions from coming up in the brain. I, I, don't, I don't think so, we can. No. <laughs> Any further questions? If not, let's give a big applause to Per. Thank you, Per.